Welcome. I am Denise Willing Boer, President of the National Watercolor Society. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I would like to welcome you to our 100th International Open Exhibition. What began 100 years ago with a few artists who came together to exhibit, paint, and collaborate has grown into an organization of thousands from around the globe. Please join me in taking a short stroll down through the first 100 years. Inspiring and promoting water media artists for a century. With an exciting vision and a new appreciation for an old art form, the California Watercolor Society was founded in 1920. As the country grew, painters found inspiration in the expansive Western lands and were pioneers of a new spirit. The California watercolor movement can be divided into three segments. The energetic, innovative, post plein air landscape period, 1920s and 1930s, the middle, gestural abstract, tri-mixed media, abstract expressionism lookalike period, 1940s and 1950s, and the later, pluralistic, U.S. is California, anything goes, drown us in choice period, 1960s to present. To those who still look to the past for art, let this be revealed, that we are on the threshold of something very fine and true to America in the work of young artists of the West. To those with vision, this renaissance, this spiritual awakening of art, must come out of the virile young people of the West. Henry de Cruyff, 1923. Dana Bartlett was the Watercolor Society's first president in 1921, the same year that L.A. Chouinard School of Art was founded by Nelbert Chouinard. During what we will call the lively years, 1935 to 1957, Lee Blair to Ed Reap, the society flourished as it innovated, even while a carefully developed system of rules and ethics served as guidelines for each year's art board of directors. Also, special landmark events were held from 1939 to 1942 as an adjunct to the yearly annuals, travel shows, and membership shows. In 1940, the decision was made to raise money and offer awards. In the same year, the first of three biannuals was held in New York's Riverside Museum. In 1947, a progressive move was made to include reproductions in the yearly catalog. Under Rex Brandt, in 1948, a grand and lively show of drawings were shown at the Santa Barbara Museum. Jules Langsner wrote in Art News, no longer is the society's annual stamped with endless variations on rocky California coasts and gingerbread houses. Emphasis is upon personal style, upon taking full advantage of watercolor as a medium expressive of the artist's handwriting. An idyllic high point in the watercolor movement was reached in the 1950s. The influence of abstract expressionism was rampant, offering artists a kind of endless challenge to painterliness and personal imagery. With the 60s came a gradual new look at the world. In the society, the compulsion for abstract expressionism persisted among many artists as well as jurors and dominated shows. The 60s produced an angry but therapeutic turbulence that resulted in Los Angeles shaping a new style. National Watercolor Society changed its name twice, 1967 and 1975, in attempts to expand beyond regionalism and add new links to the chain. I don't kid myself. I don't think the California movement is a major one compared to, say, the French Impressionists. But I think it's certainly a little more than regional, in the sense that it's probably no more nor less important than the Midwest regionalists before the war. Those painters like Curry, Benton, and Wood. Rex Brandt, Prime Interview, 1979. A 
a new sense of purpose and style can actively unfold in the work of artists of vision and energy that may only become evident through a more insightful look at how the past tells the future. The growing international view, for example, may trigger the establishing of new goals. For starters, in the 1985 NWS Annual, all four of the major purchase awards went to artists from outside of California. This 79th Annual will close the century. We can look back to 1921 and all of our hopes and beliefs that watercolor would become an influential and powerful medium. We have lived up to this early promise and have the strength and purpose to bring the new century a stronger, more innovative presentation of watercolor painting. Mary Ann Shader, President NWS. Looking back over 90 years, many, many changes in painting styles and our precious American culture have occurred. In that time, we have endured wars, the Depression, disasters, and plenty of uncertainty. It was NWS which provided the platform for so many artists to be recognized, but it also brought something else, a standard of excellence to which to aspire. Emmy, Mike Bailey, President. Salute to 100 years of raw, innovative, brave water media painters. For a century, the National Watercolor Society exhibiting artists have inspired the world with their artwork. Their clothes and tools were different, but the spirit for creating and the passion for water media has remained constant. Our reach and scope have grown through social, economic, political, and natural change. What began 100 years ago with a few artists has grown into an organization of thousands from all over the globe. Our future shines bright as we enter our next century. Denise Willing Boer, NWS President. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce our esteemed jurors for our 100th International Open Exhibition. And they are Catherine Chang Liu, Dean Mitchell, and John Salmonen. Welcome. I have a few questions I'd love to have you answer that I know will inspire everyone watching today. The first question is, if you could share a little bit about what you're working on currently. Catherine, can you begin, please? Okay. I my my just finished the painting is called the the title is The Distance Between Us. It is about migration. I drew a large boat on the bottom um, because that is the symbol of migration. And I think um, throughout history, uh, either because of extreme religion or poverty or weather change, people start to migrate, and then the people who have already been there start to be territorial, and then we have a situation. And I believe our children, our children's children will deal with this issue forever. Thank you, Catherine. Dean, can you give us a few comments about your current work? Uh, I. You know, I worked on a lot of different paintings at one time, uh, and some of them deal with a lot of poverty, a lot of modern day concerns. Uh, I'm also doing uh, works of people who have terminally ill cancer and different things like that. Uh, uh, for a long time, I've been a part of the Western shows at the Autry and Prita West and uh, these different shows. And I have, over the years, have been really entrenched in doing a series of paintings about the Native American reservations and the poverty and showing the repercussions of history. Uh, I've always felt like a lot of the Western shows are pretty highly romanticized, which I have no problem with. But as a painter, I feel like uh, I want to address more modern day concerns. And so that's been an ongoing series for me uh, right now. Thank you, Dean. 
And John? Well, even though my work uh, appears highly representational, I still think of myself as an abstract expressionist. And uh, the thing I deal with are not so much content or subject matter oriented as they are just with the physical act of, of manipulating paint on the surface. Um, my primary emphasis is the effect of light and shadow, because that's how we perceive our world. And uh, I'm continually striving to finely tune uh, the, the, the potential effects that can be created uh, by manipulating light and shadow, or uh, in our case as painters, value. And uh, mostly my work evolves from previous work. Uh, I think it's an ongoing evolution, um, and it, it's glacial in terms of speed. So I really can't evaluate my work uh, from one painting to the next. I have to look in five-year increments, and I, I, I hope to see progress. I hope to see change. I hope to see greater sophistication. Uh, but that's what I'm working on now, and that's what I basically always have worked on. And uh, as long as I find it has the ability to draw me back into the studio every single day, uh, I'm quite content to do that. Thanks, John. I know you are all three dedicated to the National Watercolor Society. And I wonder if you could share a memory that you have or something special about National Watercolor Society with everyone. Catherine? Can I begin with you again, please? So I have a story to tell. In the late 80s, um, all the board members live in Southern California, and we usually drive to a person's house for board meetings monthly. And her name is Catherine Page Porter. And her parents, um, she inherited um, several blocks of property in Hollywood. So she is quite wealthy. She loved, lived a sort of a luxurious life. And why do we have four meetings there? It's because she will hire a chef, cook our lunch. Or cater the lunch. Sometimes it's the lobster. Sometimes it's, you know, um, beef Wellington. Very fancy lunch. And we went there for that lunch. The meeting is just an excuse. Thank you, Catherine. Um, just a special note that uh, Catherine Chinglu is a past president for the National Watercolor Society. And we thank you for your service. And Dean? Oh, man. You know what? Uh, <laughs> you guys may get a kick out of this. Um, I think one of my first trips to NWS, um, I got picked up at the airport by these wonderful women. And uh, I didn't realize how hysterically funny they were. And they had this, somebody kind of, you know, <laughs> broke wind. <laughs> You know, you know, actually pass gas in the car. Well, and it, they kept passing gas in the car, and I was like, "What is going on?" And come to find out, they were they had a little they had a little machine with a little thing that they would push, and it would make this. Stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that was the most miserable thing for me. That was just hysterical. For me. we all kind of laughed because there I was going, "What is going on with somebody?" <laughs> <laughs> That was just, you know, so I thought, boy, this is going to be, this is going to be a fun show and a, and a fun group of people. But aside from that, aside from all that, uh, was, you know, just the friendship and the camaraderie and the fact that for me as a, and I will speak wholeheartedly about this, these kinds of shows for me as, a, and I will have to say as a person of color, helped me break across racial barriers to get my work seen in American art. And I will always value these kinds of societies, particularly NWS, because I became a member in my early 20s. And that meant a lot to me. Uh, it encouraged me as an artist. Uh, and just to see the amount of time and the care 
and the love and the amount of dedication that goes into these kinds of shows. And so whenever I'm called upon to do something with these organizations like NWS, I try to do to the best of my ability to give back in some fashion or form because there are a lot of artists who these shows give a lot of hope to. And I am one of those. And at a time when I was entering, I can tell you right now, rarely any artist of color would even enter them. And as they saw me emerge on the scene and how I emerged on the scene, they themselves began to participate in these types of shows. So I want people to understand how I feel that these kinds of shows are, have been hugely valuable uh, to an art community that is, 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 is really underserved. We can see that kind of climate that's going on now. And so these kinds of shows have just been really, really great. But like I said, aside from that, great people. And, uh, I, you know, I just, I just had a lot of fun with them. So, you know, and meeting a lot of different artists. So it's, it's just been great. I just want people to know that. Thanks, Dean, for all your involvement with us. I know you said you got your signature membership when you were in your early 20s, right? Early 20s, yeah. Probably 22, 20, 23, something like that which is yeah. pretty amazing. And also you do work with underprivileged artists in your community by providing scholarships. I try to give back as, as best as I can and also try to educate people about watercolor. I'm, I'm in a lot of shows out West and I really champion this medium because I think it's, it's, it's in some ways sometimes underappreciated in a certain group of collector uh, uh, Sometimes at certain shows, there's just a certain kind of bias for watercolor. And I think that hopefully curators and museums will take up a, a longer, harder look at watercolor because I think it's made the most advances over the last, you know, decade, 20 decades or so. More so than even oil paint. I think watercolor is being used on, in so many unprecedented ways. And I think it's high time uh, that, it's, uh, that it takes its place. It's a master's medium and should be the museum should also honor it as well. So, so NWS is definitely a part of that, a part of that, uh, that voice. Thank you, Dean. And John? Well, I feel compelled to point out that much like Dean, I was quite young when I uh, achieved signature membership. I was in my early 50s. Um, there, are, there, there are a lot of stories uh, that I could tell. Uh, many of them are uh, more suitable for the bar uh, so I've tried to sort through and find one that was possibly more PG rated. Um, several years ago, I had an opportunity to serve on uh, the jury of selection for NWS, uh, along with uh, Carol Barnes and Carla O'Connor. Um, this was back in the day when we viewed slides. So we got together in a dark room and uh, there were, I think, uh, around 1,000 entries that year. Uh, and we looked at 1,000 slides, one carousel at a time. Uh, we had about eight carousels lined up on the table and we were working our way through uh, carousel seven. We were all getting very, very tired. It had been a very, very long day. And uh, we're going, voting one slide at a time. The only uh, concession to technology was that we each had the equivalent of a remote control wired up to a board. So we had the opportunity to press yes or no. And uh, a light lit up on the board and our vote was recorded. So we were just approaching the end of the seventh cassette, looking forward to the last and final cassette. When over in the, in the gloom, I heard uh, Carol Barnes uh, holler the, the S word. Uh, and we all stop my, my gosh what happened and uh carol carol are you all right well in the dark uh, she had turned her remote control upside down and every time she pressed yes she was in fact pressing no uh and since the technology didn't keep track of our boats we had no choice but to go over uh, to, to the beginning of that set and start over and the thing that was really very very educational to me was I was having a heck of a time remembering how I voted uh, the first time. So I'm glad there was no permanent record of that. Um, that was the first time I had met either Carla or Carol. We are, we are fast friends. 
uh, today. And I, I have to agree with Dean that we enter shows, we travel to shows, sometimes we win awards. The notoriety of seeing your painting and your name in a catalog is wonderful. But at the end of the day, um, it's all the people we've met along the way and people that we uh, have called friends over the years. Uh, and, and it's been a dividend that just keeps paying and paying and paying. Thanks, John. That was really interesting. And I wanted to thank you for putting together the Master's Award, which we give out at the International Open Exhibition every year that keeps growing and growing. All the signature members uh, donate to it, and they are so proud to be able to be a part of that award each year. So thank you. In all fairness, it was Valley and Penny and I that were uh, involved in those discussions. So uh, shout out to, to them as well. Thanks, John. Now I'd like to go on to a question about the jurying process. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about during the artwork, uh, working with each other, and also the effect of the pandemic and social unrest. Can we begin with you, Catherine, please? I think we each had a couple of weeks to look at the entries, and we assign each painting a score. And then we, I think after a couple of weeks, we met uh, just just like a Zoom meeting. We, we met online and then surprise, surprising to all of us is the high score paintings we all agree on uh, was like over 60 paintings. So then we work for the next couple rounds to compile the show, which is like a hundred paintings. Um, so I was surprised at how, so it, it had been said that if everybody um, all the jurors will probably pick similar entries. It is the awards that define each juror's taste. So we, we are looking forward to see what Mary pick, Mary uh, picks for the awards. Thank you, Catherine. And Dean? I think uh, Catherine kind of summed it up pretty, pretty well here. Um, it was, you know, interesting because, first of all, there's so much work to see. And so you have to go through it over and over and over because for me, when I'm looking at something, I want to get it my complete attention uh, when I'm looking to judge anything because, you know, artists pour their souls into their work. So you want to make sure that you really look and examine the work. And also we're trying to pick the best of what we felt was the best work. Uh, I thought we all worked well together, um, and uh, I thought it went pretty smoothly, really. Um, so I am, too, as Catherine. I'm looking forward to seeing what Mary will pick for the awards because the paintings were, were excellent this year. They, they truly were. It was a difficult show to choose. And uh, so uh, it was a little bit different for the, the Zoom thing uh, for me. Uh, I mean, I'm not much of a tech person, but actually, I, I, you know, uh, in spite of the pandemic, I, I kind of I, I kind of enjoyed the process uh, quite a bit, actually. Uh, and it's it's great to to know that we have the technology to uh, keep the arts alive and keep it moving forward, regardless. So, and the fact that artists still entered their paintings uh, also was I, I think it was you know it was great to to have the opportunity to see so many talented artists work. Thank you, Dean and John. Well. As Dean said, Catherine summed it up very, very well. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit different aspect of it. Some of the things that I think uh, NWS did uh, very, very well, that NWS does very, very well. Uh, first of all, uh, the website, uh, the jurying system that we used uh, was was pretty user-friendly. I don't think it put any impediments between us and our 
selections. Uh, NWS uh, does a good thing when they ask people to only submit one painting. Um, sometimes in shows, uh, if an artist submits more than uh, more than one painting, it doesn't always work out to their advantage. Um, my feeling is that if a juror likes one of your paintings, uh, they'll probably like all three. And it's just much more concise if, if we look at one entry per artist. Uh, I also think it's a very, very good idea that NWS asks that these paintings not have been displayed in previous exhibitions. Um, from a juror's point of view, I sometimes see the same paintings coming around again and again and again. And uh, after I have seen a painting, I tend to remember the painting. I tend to not be as impressed with it the second and third and fourth time that I have seen it. And because NWS thought of those things ahead of time, I think it makes our job uh, much easier, much more efficient. Uh, it was very enjoyable to work with everybody. I have served on juries where you may have two jurors that are basically on the same page and one juror that is not and can be oppositional. And then you find yourself sometimes getting into a compromise situation. I don't feel we had to compromise. Uh, there's always give and take. And we did discuss paintings. People uh, made decisions based on the results of those conversations. But at the end of the day, when we looked through the paintings we had picked, I think we all three uh, had very, very uh, positive feelings about the show. And like everyone else, I'm, I'm really happy to see uh, that what Mary will pick also, uh, you could not have picked a stronger person to judge this show. She's uh, not only a, a, a gifted artist, but she is a watercolorist and uh, she's... Uh, very, very current with contemporary watercolors. And that really, really works to the advantage of an exhibition like this. So uh, I think our job was made much, much easier by everything you and the group did uh, before we ever even entered the room. So thank you for that, Denise. Thank you, John. I have one last question. If you could give one tip to artists that hope to have a painting in a National Watercolor Society's exhibition in the future, what would that be? Catherine? I usually say, and uh, when I was asked this question, I usually say, if you take a hundred artists to go to paint a landscape, 95 Artists will paint the landscape. Five artists will select a different angle, reflect their own personality, and reflect their strength. And so, so when you see 95 artists, you only see the landscape. And when you see these five artists, you see the artist himself or herself, I would choose to be those five artists. And I think that's a good tip for everybody to think about. Thank you, Catherine. And Dean. Hmm, this is a really good question. Because again, Catherine kind of really uh, hit upon a lot of things that I believe in too, is that, you know, as an artist, uh, finding your own voice is, is, is really challenging when there are so many works that look similar in, in terms of from workshops and things like that. I think that those kind of things are, are great in terms of uh, showing you how to manipulate paint. But then I think that there, for me, I know that the way I grew up and, and my own sensibilities about the world is what attracts me to a space. And so the way you see that space and how you interpret that space is a very personal thing. Uh, and so I think that uh, looking at something, you know, 
when I go out to, to look at anything, I look at it from all kinds of angles. And I'm constantly looking for uh, my own personal connection to the space, aside from looking at the way light hits something, the abstraction of something, but I'm also looking at you know, how I can move somebody into that personal space of mind through my own vision from what I see uh, from the real world. And I said, and so I think that bringing your own interpretation of something uh, will separate you from a lot of artists and, and people will recognize that voice. It will recognize your hand and not just a technique. Thank you, Dean. And John? Well, I agree with everything that has been said thus far. I would also like to add, uh, from my point of view, uh, when you go down in your studio to paint, forget about NWS completely. Put it out of your mind. Uh, don't ever paint for a show uh, or don't ever paint for a particular juror. Uh, you can only paint for one person, and that is for yourself. Uh, I think one of the things that these national shows do, because people ask me in workshops all the time, should I be out there entering shows? Um, why, why should I do that? Because it costs money, et cetera, et cetera. What I tell people is uh, instead of uh, making a New Year's resolution to lose weight, uh, say I am going to enter six shows this year uh, and then pick the shows and uh, don't feel that you have to start small and work large. I, I believe right from the start that, that what you want to do is begin to compete at the area where you most want to succeed. So don't be fearful of, of entering what uh, seem to be very large, prestigious national shows. Once you have picked your six, be aware that during the course of that year, you are going to need to pick six exhibition exhibition worthy paintings. That way, uh, the threat of these looming shows will force you to go in the studio, even on days when you might not feel like doing it. And oftentimes, those are the days when something uh, significant happens. And then when it comes time to select which painting you wish to submit, um, just line your paintings up and do exactly what we do on the jury, exactly what we do as judges, and say, which one of these is the very best? and then submit your very best work. Don't worry about what the subject is. Don't worry about what the jurors or judges do uh, with their painting. What you want to show us is what you in your heart of hearts are absolutely the most committed to and that you're willing to stand behind as being absolutely the best painting that you can produce at that time. Knowing that the more you do this, uh, the better and better your paintings uh, will become. And that way you use the shows to improve. And uh, everything that comes after that is just a bonus. If the painting gets in the show, wonderful. If the painting gets a prize, even better. But realize that that means uh, very little compared to your personal growth. Um, there's a story Frank Webb tells, and he said that, you know, a couple of stories, he said that jurors... Uh, and marriages have this in common in that I'm always astounded at the choices some people make. Um, he also said that uh, if the envelope comes and you open it and your painting is rejected, he said, do what I do. He said, just say, well, that juror was a complete idiot. Um, take that painting then and re-enter it in another show. And who knows, it may win the gold medal. He said, of course, in all fairness, you do have to acknowledge that that juror is probably a complete idiot too. So don't get, don't get too concerned about jurors, judges, exhibitions, other than the fact that it provides you a wonderful opportunity to improve your own personal work. And thank you, Catherine, Dean, and John for all your insights today. There were so many artists that entered this exhibition because you were the jurors of selection. We all look up to you because of who you are as artists, your innovation, your mastery in your excellent work, and your promotion of water media. 
Thank you from all of us, the board of directors, artists, members, and viewers. And now I would like you to introduce the exhibition you chose. We are honored to present the 100th National Watercolor Society International Open Exhibition.
I am so proud to announce our two new signature members for the National Watercolor Society for three-time entry into the International Open Exhibition. The first artist is Liang Yang. And here's a quote by Liang Yang. It is a great honor to receive signature membership in the National Watercolor Society. My family and I are all happy and grateful that I have received this honor. Becoming a signature member of the National Watercolor Society, to me, means that my watercolor painting has been recognized by everyone, and it makes my connection with everyone closer. I will cherish this very much. To honor this award, I will draw and paint more good works to give back to the society and the world for their love to me. This is the happy harvest that watercolor painting brings me. I thank the NWS Jurors of Selection and the National Watercolor Society. Thanks to all the friends and watercolor artists who have participated in this exhibition over the years. Also, thanks to my painter friend Frank Sue in Los Angeles. It is because of his generosity and pragmatic help that my watercolor paintings have been presented to everyone. Congratulations, Liang Yang. We are very proud of you. The second artist is Isabella Pisano. And here's a quote by Isabella. Being given the honor of signature status was the high point of my career. I was very happy knowing the names of the jurors of whom I am familiar with and admire their superb artwork. We all have gone through difficult and uncertain times. Fortunately, I feel that my increased energy level will stimulate my creativity and plan for improving my art techniques. Congratulations, Isabella. We are so proud of you. There's another way to get signature, and that is by entry into the International Open Exhibition. You can send in three additional paintings and the jurors of selection jury you in to become a signature member. This year, because of COVID-19, that is on hold. I am thrilled to introduce the Judge of Awards for the 100th International Open Exhibition, Mary White, who is a master of watercolor, who paints the soul of her subject and draws us in with mastery. Thank you, Denise. It's a great honor to be with all of you today. Mary, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to be the judge of awards? Well, I, I think there's no greater honor uh, an artist can have than to be and to asked to judge the works of uh, their peers. And certainly I felt this way, especially that this being the 100th year, it's a big year for the NWS. Uh, it was uh, a job that, that took quite a while, a lot of study looking at these paintings. And I will say there were so many extraordinary, extraordinary uh, entries to this exhibition. I think that uh, you all should be very proud of yourself for the work that was submitted. What was the criteria you used to judge the awards? Yes, uh, when I when I look at uh, awards that I'm judging, I use a, a, a what I call a, a criteria of five points that I use, um, and I actually score each painting based on these five points. The first uh, point, as you can imagine, would be originality. Is the work you know original? Have, have I seen a million of these, uh, or is this something new and fresh? And most importantly, do I feel that this is original to the artist. Second criteria would be, is this work technically sound? And certainly we know in, in watercolor, we've got a lot of those challenges that uh, was the work, was it fresh? Did it get muddy? Did it get overworked? Uh, were there areas where it looked like a lot of mistakes were corrected? Thirdly, I look at composition. And this of course is very important regardless of style. 
regardless of subject matter? Did, did, did the painting hold together? Or were there too many focal points or too many value jumps or, or too many different percentages of, of different colors? Thirdly, uh, about the drawing, is the drawing sound. And this doesn't pertain to just representational pieces. This also portrays to abstract works as well. Is there a sense of volume? Is there a sense of depth to this painting? And the last criteria that I use, I look at each painting and I ask myself, did this artist realize what he or she was going for in this painting? Am I convinced that that's what they were going for? Or was there a lot of erasing in the background because they weren't sure? Or was the background left white because they really didn't know what to put there? So it's these five criteria that I think uh, make a well-balanced wing painting. Now, here's a hard question, Mary. What makes a painting an award winner? Uh, well, I, I think that if I could give uh, artists just one tip on what makes a painting an award winner, you know, it's a painting that stands out. It's a painting that uh, rises above of, of the crowd. And, and saying that, you know, that there is, um, that the painting, let's assume that the painting is, is technically sound. But what makes a painting a true attention getter, award winner, is something that, it, it, that painting is unique to you, the artist. That you as the artist, you know what is essential to you. And if this painting is unique to you, it is guaranteed that it will stand out above the rest. Thanks, Mary. Now, can you please present the award winners you chose? The National Watercolor Society's International Open Exhibition represents some of the finest watercolor painting being done in the world today. The entries came from all over the globe and came from a great diversity of artists showing a wide range of style and technique and, what, and showing mostly what this amazing medium of watercolor can do in works that are traditional, representational, expressionistic, impressionistic, conceptual, experimental, and abstract. Of the 27 award winners, all of them show great confidence in their technique and ability. And all of them, show complete confidence in the way that they handle their drawing, value, color, and composition. However, regardless of style, the paintings that always seem to make it to the top of the leaderboard are the ones that are strongest in concept and composition. It's those that will always have the resilience and will endure as well. The works in this year's exhibition, this very important year, all are exuberant in their inspiration and in their style and show the great spirit of just what watercolor can do. I'm very proud to show to you the award winners and to announce them to you. Okay, the first award goes to the Watercolor USA Honor Society Reciprocal Cash Award, which goes to Nicolas Lopez from Peru for the painting called Freedom Spaces. What a wonderful example of how just one color can show a great range of value and give the feeling of light. Next award is the Bonise Collins Turner Innovative Concept Cash Award. Goes to Jun Wai Dai from Singapore for this wonderful painting called Raining. It's a wonderful concept of a painting certainly original in its concept and in its execution, giving a fleeting moment of a figure moving quickly on a rainy day. Next is the Philadelphia Watercolor Society Reciprocal Cash Award, which goes to Quang Xiao Sun from China for the painting called Grandma in the Hospital. What a brave and poignant painting this is. Beautifully executed brushwork, Great simplicity without much detail, filled with raw emotion and very personal. The Jeanette Thayer Schmidt Memorial Cash Award, Potomac Valley Watercolors Inc. Reciprocal Cash Award, goes to Mike Kowalski from Australia for the painting called I've Got the Low Down Brunswick Blues. What I love about this painting is a great understanding of light, the coolness of moonlight 
beautifully composed with very little detail and just that one enhancing note of warm color activates all the rest of the coolness. The award for a first-time entry is the Yan Yang Award for Outstanding First-Time Entry Cash Award goes to Dai Xiao from China for the painting called Moment of Serenity. What a gorgeous example of the neutrality of, of warm and cool colors, great simplicity, lovely brushwork, great luminosity in this piece. The combined NWS member Donor Cash Award, the Watercolor West Reciprocal Cash Award for Transparent Watercolor, and the Blick Art Materials Merchandise Award goes to Frank Webb for his painting called Angles on the Beach. This is a true example of watercolor at its finest. Gorgeous interlocking rectangular shapes, this gorgeous arrangement of this blue-violet color enhanced just a little bit by its complement, beautiful composition, absolutely spot-on execution. The Dina and Ken Altman Family Cash Award, the Escoda Merchandise Award, and the Jerry's Artorama Turner Professional Watercolor Merchandise Award goes to Judy Nuno from the USA for a painting called Eye Candy. And this is indeed eye candy with these eye-popping intense colors, this arrangement of, of hot pinks and hot blues, all held together by this repeating element of design of curvilinear shapes. The Gold Coast Watercolor Society, Florida, Cash Award, Jerry's Artorama, Turner Professional Watercolor Cash Award, and the Artwork Archive Lifetime Master Subscription Award goes to Zhifang Shi from China for this wonderful painting called Return to Production. This is not an easy painting to do, to carry off, something with so many complicated, so many interlocking shapes, and yet this artist handled it beautifully, simplifying it, preponderance of gray enhanced by little bits of of the blue and these warm colors, wonderfully executed, and that one lone lumbering figure giving this feeling of a very long work day. The Virginia Bacon Memorial Cash Award, Raphael Savoir Faire Merchandise Award, the Art Supply Warehouse Merchandise Award, and the Ampersand Merchandise Award goes to Steve Morris for the painting called Nest in Old Red Barn. Beautiful composition in this painting, the overall shape of the bird's nest enhanced and invigorated by the horizontal gash of the board that it sits on. The texture of this uh, bird's nest is set off beautifully by the stark and dark background and those wonderfully placed, compositionally perfectly placed, beautiful little delicate blue eggs. The Beverly Willing Memorial Cash Award for a watercolor with no acrylic or ink, and the Critic Color Savoir Faire Merchandise Award, the Blue Artist Marketing Annual Merchandise Award, and the N Plein Air Pro Merchandise Award goes to Christine Misensic or Misenkic Bun of the USA for her painting called Selfie. And pardon me, all of you artists, if I mispronounce your name. We will see your names on screen and we all know who you are and your wonderful work. But Christine's work is called Selfie for this unflinching self-portrait, beautifully done, beautifully rendered, and earnestly seen. The combined NWS member donor cash award, the Pennsylvania Watercolor Society Reciprocal Award of Excellence, and the Artwork Archive Lifetime Master Subscription Award goes to Pasqualino Francasso from Italy for this painting titled Work in Progress. I love the brevity, the suggestion of this marvelously executed painting. These washes, just this hint of subject matter and detail and how the painting moves from the coolness, big washes on the left over to the warmth and staccato points on the right. The Henry and Fujiko Fukuhara Memorial Cash Award, the Blick Art Materials Merchandise Award, and the Canuga Water Media Workshops Award of Excellence Merchandise Award goes to Jai Guao 
for the morning berries. Jai is from the USA. This is a beautiful, elegant painting showing a great light on form, the way these leaves catch the light and get almost burned out, and the beautiful hint of circular light forms in the back and that gorgeous linear diagonal shape all come together for a beautifully executed painting. In salute to the NWS Board Cash Award, the painting called Autumn Thoughts by artist Zhai Qian from China. Obviously, this is a nod to Gustav Klimt. It's a contemporary rendition using the, the image of a figure against the abstracted shapes of background. I love the coolness, the sensual skin of the model, and as she is, is foiled beautifully against the glimpse of gold leaf shapes behind her. In honor of Jean Grastor, Cash Award goes to Yao Xiao from China, with a painting called The Little Girl in the Car. What a beautiful, fleeting moment this painting represents. The gorgeous, pristine, innocent quality of this little face looking through the windshield, surrounded by the murkiness of these grays, soft edges, and the, just a glimpse of the older face in the upper left. The International Society of Experimental Artists, the Reciprocal Cash Award for Experimental Art, the Holbein Artist Materials Merchandise Award, and the Issa Bay Savoir Faire Merchandise Award, Frame Destination LLC Merchandise Award, goes to Brent Funderburg from the USA for the painting called From Who I Am to Where I Am Going. What a lovely surface quality this painting has, these puddling, merging shapes, and how interesting this is that the upper portion of this painting, almost pure black and white, and how it merges down into that intensive pop of color of the iris below. The NWS Past President's Cash Award, the M. Graham and Company Merchandise Award, and the Creative Catalyst Productions Merchandise Award goes to Cody Heichel from the USA for the painting What Once Was Home. What a beautiful arrangement, composition of rectangular shapes balanced by the curvilinear shapes of the trees, and how the beautiful luminosity of this neutral color sky permeates the color everywhere. And I love that note, that warm, one singular warm note of color in the upper left window, which adds a personal narrative to this piece. The Harriet and Arthur L. K. Memorial Cash Award. The Dixon Ticonderoga, the Myer Kansen Princeton Merchandise Award, and the Holbein Artist Materials Merchandise Award. The Baffron Blue Artist Marketing Annual Merchandise Award goes to Charles Rouse from the USA for the painting Arrival. Beautiful composition, well balanced, large spaces composed, and contrasts against the smaller shapes. Lovely understanding of light on form and the beautiful interlocking shapes all combined to make a very successful painting. The Alice Leonard Memorial Cash Award, the Daniel Smith Merchandise Award, the Baffarin Blue Artist Marketing Annual Merchandise Award, and the Salus International Inc. Dr. P.H. Martin's Merchandise Award goes to Scott Ponamoni, who is from the USA for the painting MNP. What I love particularly about this painting is it captures the now in time, that how we are exactly as we are right now in the United States and frankly all over the world. I love the contrast of these two shapes, the large slender shape against the shorter rounder shape, the raw unflinching look of two women, and how this stark white background sets it all off beautifully. The Blick Art Materials Purchase Award, the Fabriana by Savoir Fair Merchandise Award, and the Shark Pack Excellence Merchandise Award, Frame Destination Merchandise Award, goes to Christine Rhodes of the USA for the painting called Under Pressure. It's an elegant and well-balanced composition of shapes, curvilinear shapes, beautifully set off by the stark, dark background. Although this is a small painting, image size is only 11 by 14, it has a great feeling of the monumental. 
the NWS Master's Award, the American Frame Centennial Merchandise Award, goes to Donna Bittner from the USA for the painting, What Tomorrow Brings. What a beautiful, poetic, and texturally rich painting this is. I love the almost experimental way that this was done, the push and pull of texture, putting down, taking off, and the beautiful balance of the dark uh, bird in the upper compared with the white dog below, how they balance and complement each other so beautifully. Stan Green Arts and Education Purchase Award for Coastal Performing Arts or Architectural Subject from the Oregon Council for the Arts, the Master Pack Merchandise Award, and the Hong Newell Gift Certificate Merchandise Award goes to Frederick Graff of the USA for the painting called Neglected. Some wonderful, masterful watercolor, so simply done and done with such confidence, beautiful arrangements of lights and darks, positive shapes and negative shapes, all come together so beautifully. The Cheap Joe's Art Stuff Purchase Award, the Sennelier by Sandbois Fair Merchandise Award, Jerry's Artorama Turner Professional Watercolor Merchandise Award, and the Air Float Systems Merchandise Award go to Dan Burt from the USA for the painting called Piazza del Mercado. What a jewel of a painting this is. The, all of the colors, the inventiveness of it, the expressiveness of it all come together to create a painting of great luminosity and sense of light and shadow. The Low Ruth Sprung Memorial Cash Award, the Golden Core Modern Watercolor Merchandise Award, the Salas International Inc., Dr. P.H. Martin's Merchandise Award, and the Jerry's Artorama Turner Professional Watercolor Merchandise Award go to Kathy Hegman of the USA for the painting called Sheltering. A beautiful, provocative, poetic piece of art here. These lovely large shapes, uh, not all completely explained, with the one figurative, the face there. And I love the lyrical, curvilinear shape of that one line left and right of the figure's face. Beautiful arrangement, appealing to the sense of texture and color. The top award for this year's exhibition is the NWS Purchase Award, which is a painting that will go into the NWS permanent collection. It's also received the Windsor Newton Merchandise Award and the Legion Paper Merchandise Award. This is the painting done by Jerry Smith of the USA for the painting called Solid Foundation. What a beautiful and successful painting this is, showing a great variety of brushwork and great confidence. Beautiful, beautiful brushwork as it describes the rock formation and the buildings. And I love the preponderance of beautiful neutral grays set off by the, the bit of, of uh, warmth light is seen in the sky and is reflected in the water. Those wonderful notes of darks shown and executed with great confidence and great sensitivity. Our congratulations to Jerry Smith for a beautiful work of art. And finally, the scholarship awards. These all go to artists who will then receive a mentorship. The first scholarship is to study with Linda Baker, NWS, AWS Dolphin Fellow, for the painting by Carrie Waller called Conservation. Carrie is from the USA. I love this great representation and a great understanding of light on form and the translucent quality of glass with light coming through it. It's a wonderful repetition of shape and transition from left to right using the same subject matter. The second scholarship is with Kathleen Conover, NWS, AWS Dauphinfeld, to artist Sue Kaum from the USA for her painting, Unconscious Sentiment. What a gorgeous and rich abstract painting this is. These large converging shapes, so beautifully done, so beautifully expressed, all counterbalanced by the lyrical line and color. And lastly, the last scholarship is with Janine Galitza 
the International Artist Director of Art of Watercolor, goes to Tan Su's Chiang from Malaysia for the painting called Exotic. This is a real gem of a watercolor. These gorgeous interlocking shapes, every them, the nuance of color in this, if you put your hand over any one of the colors, the painting wouldn't work as well. So beautifully composed all together and harmonious. And I love the delicate horizontal lines and way they activate the larger masses. If I had to pick three paintings that I think best exemplify the National Watercolor Society's uh, work, I would say it would be these three paintings. The painting by Carrie Waller, Sue Kown, and Tan Su's Chiang. The one is very representational, the one is purely abstract, and the other one is it shows watercolor and how it's simplif simplification of shapes and luminosity is watercolor at its truly the best. Thank you for allowing me to be your juror of awards for such an esteemed society. It's been my great pleasure. Thank you, Mary. Special thanks to our juror judge team of Catherine Chang Liu, Dean Mitchell, John Salmonen, and Mary White, who have made a difference today by inspiring us all with their words of wisdom and their mission as an artist. Thank you. Join me in thanking my fellow volunteer board members for their dedication to the National Watercolor Society. They put their brushes down to make our centennial year a success. Matthew Bird, Vice President, Newsletter. Judith Silo, Secretary. Nancy Swan, Membership Director. Penny Hill, Exhibition Director. Paula Fiebeck, Development Director, Awards. Beatrice Troutman, Publicity Director, Judy Saltzman, Webmaster, Kathleen Mooney, Treasurer, Stephanie Goldman, Education Director, Special Projects. We are very grateful to our special volunteers, Ron Miller, Joseph Sabiri, Shanti Kumar, Vali McDougall, Fran Wood, and Diane Jincherik, who assisted the board this year. All the past presidents, including immediate past president, Robbie Laird, past board members and volunteers that paved the way through the century. NWS Gallery Director, Louisa McHugh, who runs our gallery in San Pedro, California. The Morris A. Hazen Family Foundation. Our hats off to our sponsors and donors who helped us award the best of the best in a grand way, even though they faced hardship during COVID-19 and social unrest. Please support them with your patronage. Mary White's inspirational presentation on her life as an artist and her artwork will follow this 10 minute intermission.
on behalf of the National Watercolor Society, I'm very excited to introduce Mary White, the master of watercolor, presenting her life and artwork as an artist. So sit back and enjoy. Thank you, Denise. Being an artist isn't a job. It's a calling. It's an assigned mission answered in the way we artists live and in the way we view the world around us. I've always considered myself quite lucky as I've been able to spend most of my life pursuing this amazing, uncharted, surprising, and often haphazard life that comes along with being an artist. I began painting when I was a teenager and I sold my first watercolor when I was 16, soon after I took my first watercolor workshop at a local art league in Chagrin Falls, Ohio. I was the youngest in the class and was mesmerized by watching the teacher and the adult students apply the beautiful pristine washes of watercolor. By the end of the first day, I was totally hooked by the magic of watercolor. It has been a calling of which I've never been able to let go. My first paintings were of my friends and family members, as well as the community of Amish that lived within one hour's drive from my home in rural Ohio. I used to borrow my mother's car and drive out to the country and paint the farms. I was doing plein air painting before I even knew what it was. But for me, it's always been about painting people, not folks that are celebrities or are famous, but the everyday average people that live next door or work down the street at the local diner the kind of people who live their lives under the radar. In them, I find real honesty, real humanity. I get my ideas mostly just by watching people. A painting might come from what started out as just a glimpse of someone. Perhaps it was a woman hanging clothes on a line or an old man, the way his back and knees were bent under the weight of what he was carrying. Perhaps it was the way a server in a restaurant, carrying a full plates, pauses for a brief moment, turning her face towards the window. Other ideas might be a while in the brewing and simmering process before they fully come to light. I might see something that makes me inhale, but it might be weeks or months before I know exactly what it was about that that moved me. I start by making a small thumbnail sketch in pencil, or maybe many sketches, always asking myself, how can I say more? The thumbnails are rough, without detail, leaving a lot of room for imagination to take flight. One of the turning points in my career happened 30 years ago when I moved from Philadelphia to Seabrook Island a small barrier island near Charleston, South Carolina. I was looking for models for a workshop I was about to teach, and I was told about a group of senior African-American women who lived nearby on John's Island. Many of them still spoke Gullah, which is an unwritten Creole blend language that had been handed down to them from their ancestors who came to our shores on slave ships. Many still live in tight-knit communities and still echo their traditions of their ancestors in their cuisine, their worship, and their quilt making. Several of them have become good friends and would model for me continuously over the next 25 years. Alfreda, especially, became a good friend, always introducing me to others as her vanilla sister. Through Alfreda and the other women, I learned the true value of friendship and that the only way to live life is through faith. I have always loved painting women in hats and Alfreda was always happy to oblige. She had at least a dozen of them and I think I've painted her in every one of them. I'm sorry women don't wear hats so much anymore as I love the architectural structure of them and the contrast they make to a face. It's like painting a portrait and a still life all in one. I have never regretted a single painting I've ever done, even if it was a total bomb in the making, because I probably tear up one out of every four paintings. 
I usually tear them up because they fell short in some way, such as in concept, or perhaps I overworked it. They didn't have the power I was looking for. If I do have a failure, I just start over and keep going and consider the failures as my studies, knowing that every one of them brings me closer to a successful work. The paintings that I do regret are the ones I didn't do. They're the ones I didn't make happen because I was either too lazy or too busy. Many times I was just too shy to ask the person to pose for me. Those are the ones I really regret. The painting I call 15 Minute Break was one of those paintings. I knew I would regret if I didn't ask the men to model for me. I saw them come into the diner where I was busy sketching one of the cooks. The men's faces and bodies were covered in soot. But it was the way they hunched over their lunch in complete weariness that got to me. So I pulled together the courage to talk to them and ask them if they would pose for me for some quick sketches and photographs. They agreed. The final painting is large, almost six feet in height and is now in a museum collection. It was actually part of an exhibition and book called Working South that traveled to five museums. One of the questions I receive most often is if I work from photographs. The answer is yes, but that I actually work from three other sources as well. The first source is working from life, and I love to paint from life as much as I can. It would be absolutely ideal if I could work from life completely, but that isn't always possible, given that the, my subject matter is usually a moving person. It is difficult for anyone to hold a pose as long as I would like them to. So I have to also rely on photographs for reference. But I also work from memory and from my imagination. I don't think I've ever done one painting that is exactly what I saw, but every one of them is as close as I can get to exactly what I felt. I make a lot of changes in my paintings, especially anything that I think will help it. Anything that helps to drive the feeling of what I'm going after. I never hesitate ever to change a background or what the model was wearing. This is a painting of Marty, a wonderful model from Charleston. I asked him to pose for me under an outside staircase, leaning up against the wall as if he were smoking a joint. Marty doesn't smoke pot, but agreed to pose as if he was. So he rolled up a small wad of paper and lit it. There were many bands of light coming down through the stairs, but I reduced it to just a single shaft of light. The painting is called Absolution. It's about God's love and mercy. I especially love watercolor because of its transparent quality. And I believe it's best suited to reproduce the translucent quality and texture of skin, showing the blueness of veins and the redness of warmth. If done right, watercolor can capture the veil-like quality of an atmospheric shadow as it dissolves into the dark or the soft quality of cotton fabric, or the smooth texture of white beads. The tiny details are just small shapes, each with its own light, middle tone, and dark. What we are all painting then, no matter its size or texture, is light on form. As much as I love painting the details, I save them for last, as it is necessary to get in the background and the biggest forms first. You have to bake the cake before you can decorate it. Watercolor is timing. In fact, it's the only medium that relies strictly on timing, which is what can make it so challenging and frustrating at times. Areas with soft edges must be applied quickly, wet into wet, timed to the second. Hard edges rely on waiting for the area to be completely dry. Semi-hard edges are a calculated timing somewhere in between. Everything is rapid response, leaving no room for guessing or hesitation. John Singer Sargent described watercolor as making the most of an emergency. 
I liken watercolor to riding a bicycle downhill during rush hour backwards. You just hope you've timed the traffic light correctly. I start all my paintings by drawing directly on the paper using a number two school pencil. In my drawing, I focus on shapes of values, meaning I look for the light shapes, the middle value shapes, and the dark shapes. These are what will describe the light on the form, such as the light on the face or the light on the folds of a shirt. I start painting using my largest brush, which, depending on the painting, can be as large as the brush a house painter might use. I start by tackling the largest shapes first, leaving the details for last. Backgrounds are painted in first or early, as they set the stage and are usually one of the biggest shapes anyway. As I paint, I try to paint one thing into another, such as the head into the background or neck into the shoulders. The brushes I use are mostly a round Kalinskis or a wide flat. I also use a cat's tongue, which is a one and a half inch wide brush made of squirrel hair, as well as a small bristle brush I use for softening edges. The smallest brush I use is a Kalinsky number eight. And because it comes to a point, I can do a lot with it. Depending on how I hold it, I can get a one inch wide brush stroke or using the fine point, I can paint around the highlight on an eyelash. The question I am most often asked is when did I become an artist? It's an inquiry I've never been able to answer fully, as becoming an artist is a lifelong endeavor. It's both a mission and a gift, with our North Star being a preordained set of preferences that is ours alone. Our job is to reach for what is truest in us. We may learn the nuance of color, hone our drawing skills, and persevere our way to achieve a certain level of expertise. But we don't choose our style or our subject matter any more than we choose a preference for a particular flavor of ice cream. This remarkable gift of art is something I can't explain any more than how I ended up on a barrier island in South Carolina painting a group of African-American women, or how I ended up in Oregon painting a firefighter, or in New Orleans painting a man reading a newspaper at the Café du Monde. Art chooses us. I once read a statement from an artist who said, painting is like throwing a ball against a wall. You have to throw it hard for it to come back hard. What the artist was talking about is the emotional power of work. I have since learned that viewers don't have to know your subject matter in order to understand the concept of a painting. I am aware that when I exhibit my work that the viewers most likely will never recognize the person in the painting. But my hope is that they recognize the emotion. Art is not what others feel, but it is what you feel primarily. In turn, you become the purveyor of wonder, the tour guide to what others may have overlooked. As artists, our aim is not so much to reproduce the outer appearance of things as it is to show their inner significance. We are to be poets, not journalists. I've learned a lot from my models. From them, I've come to appreciate how hard so many people in this country work and how proud they are of the work they do. But I've also learned a lot about life as well. From my models, especially the 50 veterans I painted from my recent exhibition called We the People, I've learned how important it is to persevere and to never give up. As General Patton said, courage is fear hanging on one minute longer. Many of the veterans I spoke with and painted echoed exactly that, never give up. No matter how steep the climb and how many obstacles may come your way, courage and faith will carry you through. Courage is what we need as artists too. Creativity is the courage to venture out into the unknown and to go on faith that what you are doing is right, that it is yours and that it matters. 
Creativity is the product of thought, preparation, and determination. Living an artist's life requires that you have something to say, as well as the courage to say it. There's never been a better time to be an artist than right now. The opportunities to show and sell your work to others around the world via the internet and social media is something we could not have comprehended one generation ago. Through technology, you are able to access great examples of work and to study it. We have an ever-present audience, as well as an ever-present younger generation eager to watch and to learn from us. As artists, we are able to portray our vision, our hope, and our point of view in ways that others cannot. We are the ones who have the audacity to dream. The commitment to do your very best work, regardless of failures, should be your primary goal. Strive for excellence, not perfection. Instead of copying what already exists, aim for your greatest vision, your greatest imagining. Do not be stifled by what you perceive to be your deficiency of skill, for there is great freedom in ignoring the exact. Not worrying about being absolutely perfect will give you the freedom to grow without feeling badly for when you fall short. Gain excellence by studying the work of the masters and fill your mind's eye with what you deem to be truly fine work. Emulate techniques and procedures until you amass a large vocabulary and are able to say anything you want. Analyze the vision of others and yours. Sign up for classes to learn even more. Aim for what is possible. Let your goal be worthy of your efforts. Being an artist is being a conduit of beauty, a scribe of this exact moment in time. It is not important if you think your ideas are as good as another's. What is important is that you seized upon you your uniqueness and your moments of greatest joy. To be an artist is to give proof of God and the beauty around us. And for this, I've been most grateful. I've had the privilege of painting the people of our times, and in them, I have discovered the profound qualities of the unrelenting human spirit. The binding commonness of our emotions is what drives me to keep painting, to keep exploring and to demonstrate the painting is so much more than copying what already exists. Everything we paint, if done with earnestness and love, becomes at the very least, not only a portrait of ourself, but a portrait of us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for sharing your heart as an artist and your magic of watercolor with us. We will take that with us as an inspiration from all our viewers and our members, artists, and board members. Thank you. We appreciate your patronage, membership, and support of the National Watercolor Society, a powerful water media organization that is 100 years strong. Thank you. For more information on the National Watercolor Society art, artist, and membership, please visit our website, online gallery, YouTube stream, and our social media. National Watercolor Society has inspired the world for 100 years and will be a beacon of artistic light for the future. We, the members, are the National Watercolor Society. We stand together 100 years years strong. And now a word from our sponsors. Hey, bonjour! This is Pierre from Savoir Faire, and here we are at the National Watercolor Society Convention, and I'm so glad to be with you. Even though it's virtual, I'm still with you, and uh, 
Congratulations. 100 years. It's a centennial. For 100 years, this society has been thriving. I'm so proud to be part of it. But today, we're celebrating another thing, is the award, you know, the winning of the award of, oh, let me make sure, Brent Funderburg. I think, if I get it right. So anyways, uh, congratulations. It's fantastic work. I saw your work. It's, it's, it's great. And this is what we are giving you. We are giving you two of my favorite brushes. One is the 6234 from Isabelle, which is pure blue chasm scroll from Siberia, and has the particularly particularity to have the finest, thinnest hair in the world. So therefore, it carries a lot of water, and by capillary action, it can uh, carry the water in a very even way thanks to all the natural hair that grabs, grabs the water. So that's, and you know, this is a new packaging, a new handle, new cosmetic, it's the uh, vintage. So we have redesigned the old, very old <coughs> design of, so it's a very fine wood, quill, a real quill. And you can hang it like that. This is fantastic. You are the first person to get that brush. It's the Isabelle Vintage. You have also the Kolinsky 6227, which is very tapered. It gives you an amazing, amazing fine line point of the, you know, minimally, I mean, not minimalist, the miniature painter. They love it. It gives you so much detail. You can paint a little hair or something. So here, I wanted to show you something real quick. Here's to give you an idea how hair behave. So this you have synthetic, sable, and scroll. So let's talk about the scroll versus the synthetic, if you will. So the scroll, you see it's here when it's dry, and look when it's wet, it, it gets about three to four times bigger. While the synthetic, you know, absorb water just a little bit. It gets a little bigger only. So that's demonstrate the fact how natural hair is much better still yet for water color. So then, uh, with that, I just also wanted to show you why Brittany, which has been the capital of brush making since the 19th century, and this is one of the reasons why, because the ladies, you know, who make the brushes have been doing it for generations, and they used to make the lace, you know, or the net for the fishermen, or the laces for the coif, which Brittany is very known for that. So those ladies have so good hands. You know, it's amazing. You know, and the way those brushes are made by hand, they're each different with the perfect point and all that. So hopefully all this will inspire you. And on that note, I would like to say, go paint with watercolor. Hi watercolorist, Artwork Archive here. To succeed as an artist, you need to be an entrepreneur, a marketing professional, a sales expert, an inventory manager, and so much more. Let Artwork Archive help. We make managing the details and promoting your work quick and easy so you can spend more time creating art. Artwork Archive is an online suite of business tools that allows artists to organize their inventory, track sales, and share their art with buyers. In today's world of online everything, it's paramount to move your art career online. Luckily, we've been at this for over 10 years, so I've perfected the platform for you. How has Artwork Archive helped artists around the world? We can get organized with our online tools. From contact and sales management to location and provenance tracking, Artwork Archive gives you the tools you need to be a professional artist. Track everything from your exhibitions to expenses to artist statements. Grow your business with an easy-to-use platform. Impress galleries and buyers with beautiful and consi consistent consignment reports, gallery labels, invoices, COAs, and more. Invite clients to a VIP private room of curated works. Get paid faster with online invoicing and payment processing with PayPal. And lastly, get discovered with a polished online portfolio. Gain exposure and sales with your very own public profile page, which you can embed onto your website. Be a part of our discovery platform to get your work seen and connect directly with thousands of interested buyers. 
Artwork Archive partners with National Watercolor Society. Not only do we give away a free lifetime subscription to an awardee, but we also offer a 20% lifetime discount to all members, which can be found at artworkarchive.com backslash NWS, or you can learn more by emailing us at info at artworkarchive.com. Have a great day.